mindset, what, what are you coaching people to do right now? And how are you coaching them to emerge? Yeah. Well, uh, I would say, uh, I'm, I'd like to a- answer a slightly different question. Like what, I think you said, what's their mindset right now? Yeah. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm observing with their mindset is a genuine concern for their employees. And it's important, what I'm coaching them on, it's, it's important not just to have that concern, but it's, a, it's an opportunity and a, uh, actually an obligation to honestly communicate with your employees about uh, and show them that you are concerned, have empathy, show leadership. And it's important that you do that at all and that you do it a lot because people need to, especially in this time when we're, when there's a, a, things are changing so quickly and they're remote and separate from each other. Yes, you can use Zoom, but it's important to have that lifeline, that umbilical cord from the leader of the organization that's constantly updating them with, well, uh, and to make sure that they know that you've got the leader of the organization who is staying on top of things, thinking about planning, caring about uh, how the employees are uh, doing uh, and, and how they're feeling and are they safe and what's their mental state. But it's, it's, it's important that that communication occur fairly constantly as opposed to, let's say, once a week. And I'm, I'm, so I'm really coaching them to um, have constant communication um, uh, with their employees. Business transparency as well as personal transparency? Uh, yes. Y- yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I just had a CEO um, that sent a message out to his employees last night and he copied me on it. And the level of transparency he shared about his feelings and he, he, was, he was vulnerable. He said, I hope I'm making the right decisions. Um, and I'm, I'm fearful that I'm not, but I'm, I have your best interests at heart and I'm making the decisions with, with that in mind. So I thought that level of uh, transparency and honesty was compelling. The vulnerability of it, I think. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What about you, Dave? I agree with what Mike has shared and what I see in the day-to-day field is when you have a prospect selling team in this environment, there's a very real concern about our prospects willing to even take a phone call right now is the market that I've normally sold into even available to sell to right now and outcomes are driven in a sales environment based on closing deals. And so that, that has dramatically changed. And so as I think about the, the prospecting selling team and the conversations that we're having, it's all around what can you be doing to help your community, help your network of buyers be successful right now. So I'll give you an example. We've developed a whole COVID-19 resource center for our clients. Um, there's a, a lot that's going on in some of the, the stimulus package that's unwinding a number of things in the healthcare system that our services and tools can do a lot of good for. And so that's easy for us to circle around our clients and help enable them to take advantage of those things. We can do the same thing for our prospects and there's not a fee for that. And so just being a, a service and driving value towards folks, not asking them for a meeting right now, if you're calling on a hospital system right now and you're trying to get a meeting, probably a bit tone deaf. And so, but they may need certain services. They may need things that we can help them with. And so part of it is control what you can control. And what are the things that you can do today that will enable you to be successful into the future? And I talk a lot about now is a good time to be investing in yourself, investing in your skills. And I'll, I'll just throw out one example. Uh, many of the salespeople in our, our business actually haven't been on the front lines of what our product does. And so many have, have called and said, hey, can I spend eight hours a week in the service center taking phone calls and, and talking to employees of these employers that are our clients 
and really understand how I can help serve them better. And it's giving them such a deeper appreciation for the product and the service of what we do as a business and what we stand for as a business. And I'm seeing the emergence of that. And so it's, it's finding things that you can do now that create value for yourself so that when you emerge, you've got a better set of skills. You understand more fundamentally how to serve and help your potential buyers um, as we emerge at some point from, you know, from the current situation. You hear, here's a, a, another real life example. Pre this pandemic, telemedicine was sort of a nice to have. A lot of employers threw that in as part of their plan. And through the emergence of the pandemic, telemedicine is like on fire. But most employees don't even know that they have a telemedicine option within their, their plan, right? And so helping our clients quickly navigate telemedicine not only helps the employer be able to provide more services to their employees in this time, but it also, if you think about the impact in the community, being able to go on telemedicine keeps people from going to their primary care physician or keeps them out of the emergency room if they're non, you know, COVID-19 related symptoms, which ultimately is giving people, you know, uh, help flatten the curve and doing our part and being socially responsible. And so we see a big responsibility in help getting some of those things out. And so as this thing continues to emerge, I think more and more of those um, things come out and you, you as a business, you as an individual figure out how do I take the things that it's giving me and create value and do something meaningful with it. Um, I just want to throw one thing at you that I've been preaching literally for 20 years. I tell my customers, stop training your salespeople in a classroom where it doesn't do a damn bit of good mm -hmm. and start training them at customers because it, it allows the person to not just see what the product is. Actually, it teaches them how it's used. You know, the sales guy will tell you what it does. The sales guy will tell you what it is. I want to know how it's used. And that way I'm, I, I get hands on training. And in a week, I'm more prepared to go out into the field than I could be in a month in the classroom. And I, that pragmatism is uh, of what you're doing right now is, is going to kill in the marketplace when you come back, literally. And, and you know, might there's, wanna, there's an added pardon. benefit to that too. You talk about having your salespeople get exposed to actually how the product or service is consumed, um, you know, good, bad, ugly. But at the same time, that customer sees that you're making that investment in your people and it, and it, and it actually, I think, tightens the relationship with your customer. There's one other thing that I've taught. How to sell pales by comparison to why people buy. And when you go to the customer's place and train there, you're going to find out why they bought. Mm -hmm. And that, when you can bring that message to a prospect, boom, done. When, Mr. Jones, would you like to know why the last 10 customers bought from us? Actually, I wouldn't like to know that. <laughs> and and that's, that's a message that when you bring there, it's absolutely compelling and, and unbelievable. I agree more. And I, I always laugh because when we do an internal debrief on why somebody won or lost, it's very different when we actually do voice of the customer win loss analysis in a full 90 minute interview with the prospective buyer who either we won or we lost. And they give you a breakdown of the reasons they won or the, the reasons they didn't pick you. Um, very, very different. And I think some of those are the most impactful learning opportunities because you really see why buyers are buying your products and services and how they're valuing what you offer. And what I find the most interesting is most salespeople will tell you it's price. The reason that you're like, oh, our price was never. And it's never tell price. You, in, in about 50 of these win-loss interviews, price has not come up at all mm. right, in the uh, – in the conversation. And so um, I think that's a valuable lesson for, for salespeople that right now to, to Mike's point is a real opportunity to get familiar with what the product actually does, how it actually works. And, and to your point, Jeffrey, get out and get to where the customers are and how they're using it. So you can tangibly see it. Um, I think you're going to emerge as a real expert instead of somebody who's just a textbook expert. 
um, you're actually going to be able to have, you know, tangible skills that you can take with you um, as you, you know, continue your, your career forward. You, you definitely become more of a trusted advisor than as a salesperson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, for me, I want a salesperson who's in the meeting helping the decision to be made rather than out on a bench waiting for the decision to be made. You know, when one of the questions that you started off with Jeffrey around, you, you know, what, what are you saying to your, your teams right now? I think, you know, if we go back to, to this concept of, of how to be effective leader in these times, you, you know, it's, it's funny because Mike talked about the CEO that, you know, was vulnerable. And oftentimes I think as a leader, you, you're, you expect to have all the answers and everybody looking at you expects to have all the answers, you to have all the answers. And the reality is nobody has the answers right now. We're, you know, every, every single day that goes by, things are, are rapidly developing. And, you know, one of the things that we've moved to is a two week sprint cycle. So we, we've got the entire business on a two week sprint cycle to say, Hey, we're going to set some clear objectives for two, for the next two weeks. Cool. And at, at the, we're going to check in daily, little, little check-ins, if, even if they're 15-minute check-ins. At the end of the week, we're going to talk about what did we accomplish? Are we on track to meet our two-week sprint? At the end of the two weeks, we're going to say, what did we accomplish? What do we need to carry forward in the next two-week sprint? Because the amount of data that's coming at us and, and how fast the changing landscape is, anything more than two weeks, I, you know, right now is, is probably, you know, is, is a bit of a crapshoot. And there's a lot of things you can get done. And I think you can get people really focused and get them out of the, oh my gosh, what's going to happen long term? And just say, hey, let's get focused on the tasks that we can control right now. And as more and more data emerges, we'll continue to pivot. We'll be agile um, in this environment and, and we'll evolve as, as we learn more. But just like Mike said that the, the CEO needs to communicate with the employees, the sales guy needs to communicate with the customer. Yeah. And Absolutely. that 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 communication has to be way more than monthly. Well, I think Mike, you brought up a. I mean, we've talked about this um, quite a bit. Is fluid communication, and how are you doing that? I mean, can, can you go in a little bit more detail about that? Like your fluid communication, how you do that internally, digitally, all those different things to your employees. Yeah. Well, it's it's at this point it's largely digital, um, uh, and. But I just think the key is is frequency and in encouraging uh, encouraging your employees to to talk with each other as well. You'd asked um, you'd asked about uh, Jeffrey. I think you asked about you know what else am I am I observing from talking to some of the CEOs? And I, I what I'm seeing is a and this makes complete sense is cash is king. So let's make sure you've got uh, as much cash in your bank accounts as you can. So, you know, tap your line of credits, take advantage of the, of the government um, relief and stimulus mm -hmm. uh, to the extent, to the fullest extent that you can in order for you to optimize your chances of weathering this storm and, and keeping your employees intact. And a big part of that is modeling. So model that, that this thing, it stays really bad for two more weeks, for four more weeks, for eight more weeks, for 12 more weeks. Um, and along the way, look at your operating expenses and see what you can absolutely pare down, pare back in order to make your cash last as long as possible. Uh, that's, that's what the CEO, CFO combinations are looking at right now. Yeah. And Mike, to your point, I just watched um, someone in my convene group. What they did is they actually worked with their, their leasing company and they put some of their rent on the back end. So, of course they're big enough that they can do that. It's not gonna really affect them. Mm -hmm. However, when I was talking to the CEO yesterday, he said, what they really helped me do is they helped me save 10 employees to stay on payroll for the next five to six months. And that like really resonated with me in the moment mm -hmm. because they probably didn't realize by working together on they saved jobs. And I think that also working with our vendors and our customers is really what we're doing every day is keeping Americans working and how creative can we get? And to your point, a lot of that has to do with the liquidity of how you're planning that out because every, and we know that it's not a perfect world and 
people will get laid off and things are going to happen. People are going to go furlough, but in the big picture, I think C levels might people in your position, you're trying to coach the CEO is how do we do this in the best way possible to keep people working? Cause we don't know how long this is going to go, but you know, it's brainstorming together on those things from a cash standpoint. So we can keep people working. Um, I have a recap of where we've been. I want to share with you guys and you can add to it. It's important that the messages that are being driven from either sales level or leadership level are consistent and more frequent than ever before that you show your vulnerability in terms of how you're presenting the message and who you genuinely are as opposed to who you corporately are because there's there's definitely two different people there that your messages are truthful because with that with an absence of truth you're going to have rumor that goes through the whole company in about five seconds yeah and the messages have to be perceived as helpful and not bullshit Yep. There has to be a definitiveness of here's what we have to do right now. And here's how this is going to work. And here's how this is going to help. And here's the message that you need to convey. And here's a few ideas that I think you can use to be able to make this happen. That's the genuine leader. And that's also the genuine salesperson. Yeah. I agree, and- Jeffrey. And w- one, one thing that's, you know, for, for the other, whether it's chief revenue officers, chief sales officers, or, or sales leaders out there that are, are there's going to be some tough decisions that are made in terms of pulling back on certain things that salespeople really like. And, and I can speak directly as from being a chief revenue officer. So there's a, you talk about vulnerability. There can, there can also feel very lonely because some of the decisions that you make, you know, won't be popular but it's for the safety of the broader organization. And to Brian's point about saving lots of people, being able to extend your cash further. You know, I can give you an example. I've, I've, I've had to make some unpopular changes to our commission structure, some of the incentive trips and so forth. Um, and they're not popular. And we know when I go and I, and I do small, you know, fireside chats with the uh, smaller teams, uh, versus the broader team, some of that comes out in the field, um, and they're you know they're frustrated, and and they then then it's a, a connection to oh my gosh the sky's falling, and you know not that I want everybody to understand what it's like to have to make those tough decisions. It's what I signed up for at this level, but there is it you know there is this. And again, I think lonely is is the right word. You're laying in bed at two o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how to make sure you you drive every amount of retention you can on revenue, how you get every new client you can possibly get in the door because you understand that to the degree that you execute on those two levers means keeping 1,300 employees employed, safe, and navigating through a pandemic. And you know, I think I would say to the other sales leaders, it, you know, it's okay to, to feel that way um, because it's natural and, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's real. And that, that's just the, the, the part of being at that level and having to care for that number of people. It goes with the job. And I think if, if you can really embrace that and understand that and be real mm-hmm. about that, I think, you, you know, people will understand long term that you made those tough decisions out of the, the good of the, the broader company. Yeah, and Dave, uh, I think- Mike, hang on one second, Dave, your company's lucky to have you. I agree, yeah. And I, I also think, Dave, is I've been just touched by how some of our employees have said, look, let me step up and let me help. We have three people that are in director roles that manage people. And right now we're all in on helping our customers and three people at the director level said, look, let me move over to this department because I know this is not the title that I signed up for, but I love working here and I want to keep this company emerging. So I'm going to take a whole different position. And I know deep down in my heart, it's not necessarily the position 
that they said, this is what I want to do for the next year, but they know for the value of the customer and for the company that this is what I need to do. This is how I can help in this moment of time. We had a, a happy hour last night. You know, there's a hundred people on Zoom. We all had a drink and, you know, it brought tears to our eyes to talk about these three individuals to say, you know, this is what great employees do. They do it for the company. And, you know, they could have easily said, you know what, that, 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 that's beneath me, right? I'm not going to do that job right now. Instead, they're like, that is what the right thing to do at this moment, at this period of time, because this is going to service our customers and this is who I am. And, you know, that's really when you get goosebumps to see employees do things like that out of the good really for our customers. But I don't understand why, and maybe you can help me with this. What's the, what's the mindset of that uh, CFO or the CEO or the sales leader that says, I'm, I'm taking your money away from you? Yeah, you know, I'll just say to you, to you um, we personally in our business have not made any significant changes to territories, comp like the, the construct of the comp plan, it's more about the timing. Um, and, and so getting the timing right and in coordination with the business and preparing, you know, to not outlay, uh, you know, a large sum of cash prior to actually collecting cash, right? And so there's that cycle in the good times where you're not worried, um, you know, about cash flow where you can do that. And so really what I, I, what I, I'll just kind of walk you through how we laid it out when we made that change. Cause it's a significant change in the terms of uh, I did it in the middle of a month and not as opposed to the start of a month. And so that impacted people on the front side of that decision and the back side of that decision pretty significantly. And for me, I just, I try to be, I'm super transparent, open individual. I try never to be, salesy or, or corporate -y. It's just be, being real. This is, this is the reality of where we're at. And if we, all, if we all experience a little bit of pain, no one individual has to experience complete pain. And, you know, I would say to the most part, most people understand that. They inherently get it. Um, but as you can imagine, um, salespeople can sometimes be very um, about me and my commissions. Wait, wait, let me write that down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> profound, right? And so um, we've got a very tight culture and it did impact a few people. And I had a couple individual conversations and I think where we started to where we ended was a very different place. And I think, again, I don't expect people to understand exactly what we're doing in the boardroom or in the executive um, in executive meetings in terms of the planning and the modeling that Mike spoke to. But I do expect everybody on the team to care about the person to the left, the person to the right of them, because we're a team. And, and in our culture, no, no one individual has won a deal on their own. It's taken an entire organization to yeah. an opportunity. We call that organizational selling. And so I think when you just lay it out to people and you connect it to the reality of the situation. It's not, you know, us trying to boost profits. Yeah, one thing, Dave, to piggyback on that, and you mentioned this before, is what's the three or four things that you're taking to your group that you have a clear direction? And I think, Mike, you talked a little bit about that too. It's, it's almost like it's not a comp plan anymore. It's a help plan. What's the plan on how we're gonna help our customers prospects out there that may need our services to help them during this time. And Dave, here in a minute, I'd love for you to just talk about your, your outbound phone call of your 22-year-old BDR that helped the company during this time because it was all about how can I help you rather than here's my 30-second value statement during this, this turbulence and can I hook you. It was more of here's how I think we could help and I know it turned into um, a really, a really successful story that the client's going to benefit or the potential client and your company will benefit. But I almost see this, Jeffrey, to your point, you know, for people 
to really talk about comp plans. I think this is the wrong time for it. It's really talking about help plans and how are you going to help and what are the three areas we can help impact the most right now. And that's what you wrote down to your sales team, your marketing team. You know, Jeffrey, we had a guy on yesterday that talked about how he's completely re-engineered to help the healthcare and hospitals right now. It's not even what they do. So I think that's, you know, the new direction he's going with his sales team right now. Here's how we're going to help. Dave, do you mind sharing that story on you know, how, how you guys have done that? No, not at all. And what's interesting about the story is when, when we really started to go work from home and we started to build our communication cadence, um, we've got a really strong business development rep team um, that, you know, young, they, they haven't had a lot of time in their career like some of us to navigate either a financial crisis or, or something else. And so I, they, they, the, the leader of that team said, hey, it'd be great if you could come on, you know, give a pep talk to the troops and, you know, really, you know, bring some clarity to what's going on and help. And, and I'm sitting there, it's, it's like day one of work from home. Right. We did work from home on a Thursday. He, he asked that I join the team on a Friday. I don't have all the answers. And so I get a question from one of the business development reps. Hey, how would you sell in this environment today? And I'm kind of, you know, hey, I, you know, be very thoughtful, be empathetic. And I'm, I'm, I'm on my toes a little bit going, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out, you know, with you, with you all. Right. In my, in the back of my mind, but in my, in my, my mind, I'm they're, they're expecting me to have like crystal clear answers right now. And I don't. And literally one of the business development reps who uh, moved from our corporate office uh, to a remote territory all on his own. First time working from home. He's out uh, Pacific Northwest. And he, he tells a story. He goes, Dave, let me help you. I got a story. I've been trying to get in front of this organization for two and a half years. I've had zero emails returned, zero LinkedIn attempts uh, responded to, and zero phone calls ever uh, taken or returned. And he said, you know what? In this time, I just keep thinking about what it must be like for our buyers inside their organizations right now. Our buyers take care of their employees, make sure their health benefits are intact and they know how to use them. And it's got to be the, one of the hardest jobs right now in America as people are wondering whether or not they're going to contract um, the coronavirus. And he said, I just want to help them. So I sent a, uh, basically a toolkit to this, this team and said, hey, I, now's not a good time for us to meet, but we put together this entire toolkit for how our um, clients are managing through this pandemic. And I just wanted you to have it. No, no, no strings attached. Just take this woman picks up the phone, calls him and says, this is the most thoughtful thing anyone's done. That was interesting. The thing that stuck to me the most was she mentioned in that phone call that one of our competitors who they're currently using today hasn't even called to check in to see how they're doing. And she said, we're, we're knee deep. It's a, it's a very, very large retailer. And this, you know, lots of store closures right now. We're managing through all this. On the other side of this, we want to sit down and meet with you. And then she said, if you have any more of these toolkits, let me know. We had another uh, working from home virtual toolkit for organizations to take advantage of, sent that and got a note back from the CHRO saying, these are some of the most thoughtful things anybody's done for us. And so you know, in that moment where I felt pretty vulnerable because I didn't have an answer, here's a innovative young um, professional who's just getting started in their career, who's thinking about different ways just to be a good human being, another good American citizen to help out somebody else. And I just thought that was a really, you know, perfect time for that story that, and it resonated with the broader team. You know, you know uh, another thing that, Mike, you brought this up on a a Zoom call, not another call, because that's how we communicate today, but loyalty. And I remember a quote that you said, people become more loyal after the storm based on what you do during the storm. Yeah. And that part, I, I wrote that down. And it's even like I'm pushing myself to think every action I take during this time, that's how they're going to see me after the storm's over, which it, it will be over, right? Eventually. 
can you just expand on that? Cause that was like, makes me think about it every, every day now, like I gotta make sure I focus on that. Cause that's the reality of it. Well, I think it gets back to that being honest, being vulnerable and not just saying you care about your employees and their well being, but, but demonstrating it and, 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 and having it be very clear to them that you're not just saying that because it's the right thing to say. No. Um, and, and, you know, talk is cheap. You know, you walk the walk. And part of walking the walk is doing everything you can to main, retain them as employees. Um, because it's the right thing. Ultimately, it's the right thing to do for your company. Because this storm will pass. And think about, we came into this with 3.5% unemployment. Um, it was hard to find good people to come to your company. We're going to get to the other side of this and we're going to have low unemployment again. And we're going to have, we're going to have a new normal, but the, the loyalty that you have earned during this storm is going to be essential to, uh, and, and I think you can come out of this. This is a concept of passing in the curve where the, the, the curve is this is, is we, we're going down a straightaway at 150 miles an hour. Now we've come to a curve. It's the pandemic. Um, there's a concept of passing in the curve where if you do the right things and you, you um, focus on the right things and you, and you do the right things in the curve, you can come out of this passing your competition as you come out of the curve into the next straightaway. And I think that's by keeping the accelerator on. At the end of the day, Dave, you said something, you know, another call that we had about the weight room and what you're doing for yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at first when you said the weight room, I'm like, come on, man, where are you going with this? Right. But it like I wrote down like a lot of the stuff that you had shared with us that you do in the weight room for yourself, which really you're doing it for your team. Yes, you're doing it for you, but you're doing it so you can be better for your team in the weight room. Could you go through and expand on that? And I know, Mike, you have ideas, too, on that, too. But what you're doing and how you're using that weight room during this time. Yeah, I think this environment creates an opportunity for you to take one of two paths. And I think the one path is to sit by and, and wait and figure out what's going to happen. Or the other path is, you know, what I would call this concept of the weight room. And what are you doing to better yourself physically, mentally, and, you know, spiritually, you know, wellness, whatever it is that you want to work on as an individual, the, the amount of resources available to individuals today, uh, whether it be online, uh, through apps, whatever it might be, there's just a ton of stuff available. And so as I think about when we come out of this, what are the, what's the muscle that you're going to need to flex to be as best as you can to get, to accelerate through the curve to Mike's point, and be able to pass your competition. And I think digital marketing and digital selling is gonna be, this is a thing moving forward. And so if your social selling skills or your digital selling skills aren't as strong as they need to be, spend the time getting proficient in those. Spend the time understanding how to do that. I talked about the individuals that are getting certified in, in taking phone calls for various things around our product. Every certification they get, every phone call they take is leading them into, it's another rep, it's another set in the weight room that's giving them the muscle they're going to need to be successful for the long haul. And the other thing, by, by getting in the weight room and taking action, I think it also demonstrates your, your resiliency, you know, attribute to say, hey, the worst possible thing that in my lifetime that we've faced I'm finding ways to continue to advance myself personally, professionally. So on the other side of this, I'm going to be a better asset to not only my organization, my family, my community, all of those things. So someday these are our future leaders. I think about this individual that I mentioned, the, the, the young uh, business development rep on the story. He might inherently be leading a team in 20 years, something different than's going on. And to be able to draw on what you did in the weight room and what you did through this, I think what will, will, is the next generation of leaders to help us as the world evolves and we face different challenges in the years to come.
Yeah, and it's every seems like every 10 years we go through a recession. My sister's in private equity and she says, Brian, always plan on the zero. It's going to be a year before, a year after, right on the year. What I'm seeing during this, to your point, is you're going to have young di- individuals right now that 10 years from now or 20 years from now, when they hit a recession, they're going to step up and say, this is nothing. You should have seen COVID-19 yeah. what we had to go through. And here's what we did to come out of it, because we will, but they're going to have that experience to share with people and lead because they went through probably the biggest impact or the, the what's going on right now that they're going to have those experiences. You know, one thing that you mentioned about the weight room, I had jotted down some notes from that. You're developing new skills right now that you're going to teach others. Number two, it's almost like as leaders, and it goes back to Mike, like, you know, being humble, that CEO you mentioned, like, man, I just pray that I'm making the right answers during this time, right? That's, that's, that's very humbling to hear a CEO say that. But at the same time, it, what resonates with me, this is like we're getting an MBA. Some of you guys have an MBA, I do not. So it's like getting an MBA right now during a time that we're learning and training ourselves in new skills. And it's like going back to school. We're learning a lot. Also, you know, I, Mike, you had talked a lot, a lot about technology advancements on one of our call. Like, and Dave, you just mentioned it again. Like, what advances are we making? Because when we go back to work and go back to the office, what have we done to recreate ourselves from a technology standpoint? Because the best companies are, you know, zooming in saying, guys, we know that gals and guys coming out of this, it's going to be different. And how are we going to leverage technology in a different way when the sun comes out? Dave, you made me think of something when you talk about the weight room and decisions that an individual has to either sort of wait things out or sort of invest in yourself. And I can't help but think about the number of, and and I, I guarantee you guys, when you have conversations with people, invariably the topic turns to, Hey, have you streamed all seven episodes on Netflix of this Tiger King thing? Oh my God. But think about, think about an opportunity and a decision that everybody makes every single day of, am I going to stream, you know, am I going to binge on this or am I going to do something that will help me be stronger when I come out of this? I can guarantee you streaming seven episodes or eight episodes of the Tiger King is not going to make you a stronger whatever when you come out of it. And I think it's an opportunity for companies to, um, to, to even, you can even gamify that. Think about your, your, the folks that are in the weight room, you know, doing, doing uh, self-improvement things, reading stuff, um, taking advantage of some of these incredible online uh, capabilities that are, that are there now. Um, it may be an opportunity for CEOs to their organizations to challenge people to, um, to, and even gamify it a little bit. Hey, let, let's have a competition of he, see who can get the most certifications or whatever on this downtime. So you come out of this a stronger than you were. Um, let me gamify. There's a guy, uh, there's a company in Newark, New Jersey called one huddle, the number one huddle. Uh-huh. I, I know the CEO personally. I've helped my, my clients gamify all of their stuff. It works. Mm-hmm. If you want personal introduction, I would be more than happy to do it. Um, that's the number one thing. And I think that you're looking at right now at a time when it's important to have some play. I challenge my audiences, if watching this show, will, will watching this show double your income? And if it won't, you might want to think about watching something else. Yeah.